relationship. So there's another reason that God gave us a weekly gathering, the third out of four here, to help you nourish yourself with the truth. When we get together here, your attention is on God's truth. It generates learning, right? And by the way, if you're new here or you're new to the church uh, uh, family and you're just kind of trying to figure out what kind of church is this, what kind of preacher is this, what am I learning, what, wh- where is this coming from, do I agree with all these things? Sometimes I like to just remind everybody that the, preach- that the teaching here comes from the Bible, the Christian worldview and the Christian description by uh, um, these inspired authors as to who God is, what He's done, and who He's made us to be in Jesus. That's where it comes from. And by the way, I, I need to mention to you that it's such a relief to me to not have to gather all the information and all the sources from all over the world, from all of history to come up with something for you that's meaningful and valuable. I just simply say we're uh, looking to learn about God. Where do we learn about God? In the place that He's revealed Himself in words, His Word called the Bible. So that's what we're um, going to be doing when you're here on uh, the weekly gathering is we're nourishing ourselves with the truth of the Bible. It helps clear your eyes. By the way, you get out in the chaos of the world and it's so confusing. There's so much happening that captures our heart and our attention. And then we get back together and we sing about the truth and we listen to the truth. We learn the truth. We root our lives in the truth. And it helps us orient, right? In the storm, it helps us orient. It helps us say, I know where I'm headed. I know where God has me. I can sense the anchor of uh, my soul being the truth of the Scriptures that God has provided for us, who He is and what He's done. So we gather weekly to hear God's Word preached. Paul, by the way, is telling Timothy. In the New Testament, Timothy's a new elder in a church. It's his church. It's his own local church from his own city. And Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, don't forget the priority. When you all gather together, he said, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Devote yourself on a weekly basis. Always be publicly reading Scripture to the exhortation and to teaching, right? So he prioritizes it himself. The life-changing power of the message, as you know, does not come from the skill or the charisma of the teacher. It does not. I am so relieved that what God does with the Scripture is separate from the preacher. I am relieved in that Um, oftentimes my role, really what I'm trying to do is to get out of the way of the truth of the text and let God empower the truth to bring life change to us and also revelation as to who He is without me getting in the way and somehow distracting from it. But the power of the Scripture doesn't come from the um, magic charisma and skills of the preacher. In fact, what instead what it does is it comes alive because it's God's words and it belongs to Him. And the Spirit of God applies those truths to our lives and that's what brings the nourishment and strength. So for Scripture to nourish you, you need to be able to uh, digest it. You need to be able to digest it. That's how there's nourishment that comes from the Scriptures and the truth. And the goal of the preacher is not to give you... This is so important, right? And... Um, I hope you know this is important. The, the role of the teacher who's teaching the Bible is not to share with you their pet peeves and personal preferences. You know that, right? In fact, I, I, when I was kind of writing this out, I was thinking to myself, how often and when am I sharing with the church family my personal preferences or my pet peeves? And I like to think that when I am, I am uh, warning you that you're about to hear my opinion or you're about to hear my pet peeve or you're about to hear... Um, how much I love Costco. And I like to warn you that that's coming. And I like to warn you that that's coming because I I want to make sure that we have a distinction between this isn't necessarily true and always true and about God. This is in the perception of the preacher. But um, most of the time, unless there's an exception, what the preacher is supposed to do is saying, here's who God is based on his own words. Here's who we are in Christ based on His own words. Here's what He's done based in His own words. And it's my job to help the listener digest it. To carefully explain the meaning of the text or the Scripture texts. To carefully explain what it meant then and what it means to us now. To elevate Jesus in the preaching. Why do we elevate Jesus in the preaching of the Bible? Because the Bible elevates Jesus in the teaching of the Bible. That's why. And any Bible teaching that doesn't elevate teaching can be considered very similar to just virtue teaching that every other religion teaches its own virtues. What makes the Christian faith unique is that that eventually that virtue becomes embodied in Jesus 
and so, so much more. So, always verify, worth mentioning too, for yourself if what you're hearing is accurate and true. Always go back. You can learn and study and grow on your own. If you have the right resources, you can verify and validate what you're hearing from me. And um, then, then um, and by the way, if you learn that something I said was inaccurate, just keep it to yourself, will you? Just keep it to I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm grateful for um, the resources that we can find that are out there. So, so, the, so the weekly gathering, we get to nourish ourselves by being together and hearing the truth and learning the truth and growing in the truth and digesting the truth. We also, as a part of this, separately, we share communion together in community, right? We get water baptized together. So we celebrate our union together in uh, communion, in sharing the symbols of the body and the blood. And we get to publicly confess the truth uh, or we get to publicly confess our place in God's family through water baptism. And all of that brings nourishment. I don't know about you, but I am nourished every time we're sharing in communion together, and I'm nourished when we are celebrating water baptism together. And I think to myself, why is that? That's the way God designed it. We get together and we welcome someone into the family who's going public, and we say, I'm so grateful to be in unity with the family through communion together as we share that. So that's something God designed. Last thing. The weekly gathering helps you with, they help you refocus yourself with a response. You get to refocus yourself by responding. By the way, um, uh, think about this. When somebody is talking to you, like I'll give you an example. Right here, together, you're listening to me, but you know that for the most part you don't have to respond, right? Unless I beg you for one, right? You You don't have to respond. So it's easy to pay little to no attention because you don't have to respond. Let me run this one by you. What if next week, before you get here, I get the word out that when you get here on Sunday morning, I would never do this because you would never come, but but imagine this, imagine this. I said, um, when we're together, I'm going to go around the room. And we're going to go around the room and I'm going to hit you with a question about what you're hearing. That is actually... Not, that is actually not the worst idea I've ever had. Can you relate with me a little bit? What happens to your attention level? You locked in? You engaged a little bit? Some of you note takers like, I'm already taking notes. I'm ready. Bring it. Others, maybe you start taking notes. But here's what I, here's what I think is true. When you are expecting to respond to something, your level of engagement and attention goes up. And I want to run this by you. One of the reasons why we're together on a weekly basis according to the Scripture is because we're expected by God to respond to the truth of who He is, what He's done, and who He's made us to be in Jesus. And we're expected to respond in singing and prayer. Singing and prayer. Singing and prayer. So we're supposed to respond. And as a responder, we're supposed to be, we're designed to be engaging and tuning in more and more because we have the opportunity to sing in response and we have the opportunity to pray in response. Now the, old, the, the um, original early church, they had house churches. So you're together and you're among believers. And you're, you, like, you know each other and you see each other and there was conversation, engagement, and so on. People were learning together, growing together. They were responding together. In America, and I think if you go back since Constantine um, kind of like created this come to the um, place of the church type of event, and then here in America is kind of like it's, a, it's, a, it's an audience kind of uh, um, arrangement, less and less response. More and more performance. More and more just kind of looking in and watching. And, and um, you know, some churches have taken the entertainment level off the charts for quote-unquote engagement. Uh, but we're supposed to be responding with our singing and with our speaking to Him in prayer. And it helps us focus our attention. And by doing that, listen to this. Please. By doing that, by responding, here's what's happening. God helps us through singing and praying to reduce the level of focus that we have on ourself. When we get together and we're singing and we're praying, here's what God is doing. Less you, more me. Less you, more me. Less you, more me. And I don't know about you, but I've read and heard and experienced and even the research tells us the less hyper-focused you are on yourself, the healthier you become. Did you know that? 
People who are in critical space with their mental health, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, or I should say emotional health, emotional health, are hyper-focused on themselves. And when we come together, God is helping us to refocus by asking us to respond with singing and respond in prayer. Talk to Him and sing to Him. Talk to Him and sing to Him. And I know for many, um, many of you and many church uh, attenders from what I've heard, if you haven't grown up in a church, singing publicly is new to you. It's new. I mean, is there, any well, is there anywhere else non-singers are out in public singing? I don't know of any. And I tell you, if there are any places, I avoid them. I myself, not a big singer. One of the things I learned over time is that while I'm responding to God in song, I'm not singing because I have a talent to sing. I am singing because I'm focused on what God has done. I'm focused on who He is and who He has made me, designed me to be in Jesus. And then I get to respond by uh, making a joyful noise and letting Him hear my song which comes from my heart. And if the music is loud enough, I don't even have to listen to myself. It's glorious. It's always been a core aspect of God's people. By the way, do some of you remember in the Old Testament when God rescued His people from slavery, when God rescued His people from affliction, when God rescued His people from persecution, what was known about the people of God? How did they celebrate? They celebrated with singing. In fact, they had singers who were a tribe. Do you know it was a tribe of singers? And they were worshipers, and they would go out ahead. This is always kind of a weird battle plan, but they would send them out first. Weird, right? Here they come again with their horns. Boop! Oh, wait, they didn't have guns. They weren't shooting guns. I don't know, arrows. So God's liberated people. When He rescues His people, their response is often singing. Because receiving grace, here's what it does. When you receive grace, when you receive something you don't deserve, it often evokes a sense of humility and worship. It evokes adoration. You tend to adore the ones who give you the things that you don't deserve. And that's what we sing about. We sing about our rescuer who gives us his righteousness, his death in our place, his life where uh, we were supposed to live for God in devotion and faithfulness. And he gives it all to us and he rescues us from sin, death, and the grave. And as a result, what do we do? Well, what God says is sing together. Get together and sing. Sing of what? Sing of the rescue. Sing of the joy, sing of the peace, sing of the hope of the, of the family that's yet to come, eternally with God and with Jesus. So our corporate singer, singing, when we have a corporate singing, uh, we don't call it worship because our whole life is worship. We have singing together, it's an aspect of our worship. Uh, but what do we do? When we're singing, we're remembering and rehearsing what, who God is, what He's done, and who we are in Jesus. We're remembering and rehearsing. We're calling back to say, oh, don't forget. Don't forget about the faithfulness of God. Don't forget about the rescue of God. Don't forget about who He is and what He has accomplished. And every time the Israelites were afflicted and low and walking through a valley, they wouldn't sing about their circumstances except that they eventually got to what God has always done by His faithfulness. Eventually, that's where it leads in the Psalms when you read the psalmist. So they're not primarily expressing individual prayers although that can be a part of it. They're not primarily expressing their commitment to God, although that can be a part of it. And there are some important instructions. By the way, look what the New Testament author, this is Paul, he's writing to the church at Ephesus. Look what he says about singing. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead of being drunk, be filled with the Spirit. And then what happens? Well, then you're going to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among the church family. Make music to the Lord in your hearts. There is something in our hearts when we are born again and belong to Jesus that wants to make music. And sometimes what's holding us back is our sense of pride, our sense of, hey, I'm not very good and it's possible someone's going to hear me. But God gives us this challenge here in the book of Ephesians. And we see the same challenge over in Colossians when Paul writes to the church at Colossae. He says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. How? With thankful hearts. These instructions show us how singing has such an edification purpose. And that the truths that we're singing about build us up. 
it also builds up the people around us as well. And I think this is probably new for some of us. Our singing is directed to God, but did you know that we're designed to come together and sing toward the church body? I know this for some of you might be the worst thing you've ever heard in your life, but your singing is supposed to be toward other people. Can I tell you why? Here's why. Because sometimes you don't feel like singing. Some, sometimes you're just not sure there's anything to sing about. Sometimes everything that you're feeling, all the feels that you're feeling, there isn't anything cheerful about it. There isn't anything happy about it. There isn't anything hopeful about it. But sometimes your ears pick up the joy of someone else. Sometimes your ears pick up the, the encouragement and strength coming from someone else. Sometimes, and I, I mean, this is, I, I hope this has happened to you, but there are some times where I'm like, man, this is the lamest song I've ever, holy moly, is everybody singing <laughs> loud. And all of a sudden I realize, who cares what the song, whether or not the song is my preference. There is, these people are in. They're all in. They're really singing. And I find it encouraging, edifying. In other words, if I were by myself, I would have quit on that song. I would have quit on sing, singing, but I'm not by myself. I'm with the people, God's people. And I want you to, I want you to, I hope you can hear this and receive this from me. Sometimes you're not singing for yourself. Sometimes you're not singing for yourself. Sometimes you're singing for the person next to you. Sometimes you're singing for the person in front of you. Sometimes you're singing for the person behind you. But here's what you can, here's what you can um, hold on to that when you're among the body who is singing and responding to God through song, they are singing to God, but He has it on purpose that we're near each other so we can sing toward each other. And sometimes the encouragement you need is coming through someone else's excitement and someone else's zeal and someone else's wrong notes and bad pitch. But it's supposed to be inspiring. It's not supposed to be fine art. And I hope you're encouraged today that you may not feel like it, but your song may encourage someone else. You may not feel like singing, but I pray that God helps you tune your ears and heart into someone else's singing and you can be an inspiration for someone else. Since we eventually believe that... Um, since we eventually believe what we sing... Pastor Jonathan and I and some other church leaders have kind of made it a point to only sing what we believe. Since you eventually believe what you're singing, we make it a point to sing what we believe. So when you're singing, we believe what we're singing, and if you don't believe it, if you sing it enough, guess what happens? You're like, I, it kind of works itself into your beliefs. And oftentimes, a lot of us remember more of what we've sung than what we've heard, than what the preacher has taught so that's also important. So we're aiming for songs that are gospel-centered, that are God-word, they're about God. They are Jesus-exalting, and they are also community-focused. Right? So we're focused on congregations being able to sing. You know, some churches have really highlighted individual singing. It's Jesus and me. So what do they do? They black out here, and they brighten up the stage, and they say, it's you and God, you're singing individually. I'm not going to... No reason to criticize that, but for us, what we're aiming to do is to let you see each other, to let you focus not primarily on yourself, but primarily on God, and also with the um, ear towards we're all singing together. It's congregational singing. Is it the best way, the biblical way? Is it the only way? Of course not. But we find it to be a healthy way to do it, and I hope that um, it helps you to see and sing to one another and be inspired by the singing of other people who you can see and hear. So, what does this all mean for us? That a healthy church is a singing church. Well, what if I don't feel like singing? Like, I really don't feel like singing. And to be honest, I've heard the people around me not very inspiring. What if that's you? Can I help you with that a little bit? Um, sometimes it might help you. Let me start here. Pause and listen to your brothers and sisters singing. Give that a chance. There's also some other things that we can do. Um, how many of you have ever discovered that you can sometimes sing yourselves out of slumps and dumps? You, just, you can sing yourself. You start feeling like you're slumping and you're in the dumps. 
and by your singing, you realize that you're pulling yourself out of it. Anybody ever experienced that? Like, I'm really not doing this. All right, I'll sing the first line. I'll sing the second line. We're on the chorus now. I'm feeling a hundred times better than I did about half a song ago. Sometimes you can do that. Sometimes what you discover is that your feelings follow your faith, to sing by faith, and your feelings follow along. I feel that, I have to be honest with you, I feel that every single day I go to the gym, I'm there despite how I feel. My body tells me, take a nap, eat carbs, find a sugar store, get a waffle cone. That's what my body tells me. And I have to say, I'm not listening to you, body. I am doing what I know I ought to do. I'm going to go to the gym, and wouldn't you know it, once this rigor mortis starts to move, once the stiffness starts to give way to the warm-up, eventually I'm like, all right, I'm all in, and I always think this, I'm glad I did that instead of go to Gannon's for a large waffle cone. I'm not always, I don't always feel like I'm glad that I did that, but most of the time. And this is what we do when we sing. We say, I don't feel like singing. There's not much to sing about. I'm so distracted. Saying, just start singing. Get those words out. Express yourself genuinely. Just start to get going by faith and watch how something happens as God helps us engage with each other and, and um, starts to kind of... And you can also praise God prayerfully. You know, sometimes instead of singing, I start talking to God, God and I say, God, help my affection. Redirect it, would you? Save it. Right now it's off the rails. I'm supposed to be singing. People are probably watching me because I'm the pastor, but rescue my affections. Bring them in line with who they are and where they ought to be. And God is faithful to stir up by His Spirit my own heart as that's desired. Um, so, what do we do now? Real quick, prioritize your participation in the corporate gathering. Prioritize it. There's so many things that eat up our time. Um, by the way, do you know what's... There's one mistake. A lot of you know somebody who's a regular at the gym. And oftentimes you think of these people who are regulars at the gym and we think to ourselves, um, I would go to the gym but if I had time. And I, I've come to discover that it's not true that everyone who goes to the gym has extra time that other people don't have. What have they done? What have they done differently? They have prioritized differently. Now some of you, you're in a phase of life where literally, you know, you it's impossible. I recognize for the most pe- for the most part, most people, it's a matter of prioritizing. So I'm hoping that by prioritizing, that we less and less we ask, "Shall I go to the church gathering?" And we start asking more and more, "How can I make the most of this church gathering?" And some there are some who say the weekly gathering is too much. There's so much going on, and I literally only can attend this gathering when my calendar is open. And I've got to tell you, one of the things that still blows my mind is I know of people, and I'm sure you do too, who go to AA meetings every day. They go to AA meetings. And I often think to myself, that's a big commitment. I've also discovered that in my own gym, there are people who are at that gym an hour plus, guess how often? every day. And here's what they've discovered, that the value that they get of doing that on a daily basis far outweighs any of the calendar complications or any of the other options that could distract or otherwise clutter up their calendar. They enjoy participating. It's not fun to spectate, but it's, it's, it's far more enjoyable to participate. In the gym, it's common for someone to notice the gains that they're seeing and that they're achieving and those gains are compelling to keep going and keep it up. They are able to um, see what they're gaining by prioritizing. So, uh, after corporate worship, what about creating some special traditions on Sundays or whatever day you worship with your church family on the day of corporate worship? Create some, I mean, we have a tradition in my family, we call it Sunday nap. Sunday nap. And I used to think I was choosing the nap, but now I realize the nap has chosen me. Nothing I can do to change it. Um, a particular family meal. Um, I grew up uh, my wife, uh, in my wife's family who had a Sunday family meal together every Sunday. Um, very oftentimes related to your ethnicity or your traditions, meals with others, afternoon coffee, reading, whatever you do to set up some kind of, um, create some kind of special traditions where eventually maybe your kids look back and your kids say, those were great times. I remember those Sundays so well. And then lastly, recognize that you need your church and your church needs you. You need your church, your church needs you. 
And that's how it works. If you are inconsistent on Sunday, it'll impact your spiritual health. It'll also leave a weaker body who's gathered together without the part, your part of the body. And when you're late, you don't engage in worship. It impacts your experience. Um, and like most things, you get out of something what you put into something. My hope and my prayer is that you sense today that the church body needs you. I don't need you. The church body needs you. It wouldn't be for me. It would be for you and for us, the church family, to prioritize the weekly gathering together. Your voice, your encouragement, your solidarity, your faith, your prayer, your joy is all needed by your church body. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful today for um, how you have saved us, but not just saved us to you, but you've saved us out of isolation, out of aloneness. You have um, built in us the need to be together, and we pray today that you would help our hearts be uh, refocused, help our hearts be reprioritized, help our hearts, God, be protected Help our hearts to know exactly how you've designed us to be and to live in the fruitfulness of being weekly gatherers. Pray that you'd give us the courage to look at our calendars and say, what are lesser things that are cluttering me up? What are lesser things that are getting in the way? What could be accomplished, God, if I were making myself available all the days that I could? What could be accomplished? How much growth, fruitfulness, spiritual maturity could I experience? We pray that you would help us to experience that together. And we pray these things in Jesus, our Rescuer's name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing here together, and I urge you to sing from your heart. And uh, again, don't forget, sing like maybe someone near you uh, needs your passion and needs your full engagement today.